Well, think about being lost. Uh, when I was reared up, people could lose their salvation, is what I was taught, and on their deathbed, they needed to stop and what they were doing, repent, confess, be baptized, and go to church to be saved. Uh, they call it Roman Road, I think, about the best and all the things in Romans. So, but this is not so. I mean, you do those things, but you're not lost eternally. What what does it what does it mean to be lost? Somebody guess what what you think it is? Alright, misplaced. You can be misplaced and lost. Uh, needs to go astray. Um, morally going astray. The, uh, Dennis and I got lost not long back. Now we've all lost things. I've lost pins before and couldn't find a pin. Well, you can find a pin. So we would, you lose certain things. I lost my geek book. Dennis and I, we've looked for that thing for how long now, Dennis? A week? Two weeks? I had a light come on on the Jeep and I couldn't find my, well, I had my manual and I saw it, but we was coming to church, I think, so we put it up. And to this day, we don't know where we, neither one of us put it. We have searched cars, houses, boats, everything we got to find out where that book is, but it's lost. Things get misplaced like that. We got lost coming home from Camp Hillview. Yeah. Well, I went in one way and I come in, come out another way, went through columns, uh, coming back out. And then with him, we turned somewhere wrong and the, and the GPS was telling us the exact same way to go. And we followed it. And somehow or another, we wound up on a clay road and was desolate. No houses, no buildings, no nothing. And Janice and I were riding along and we rode and we rode and I was going to turn around and go a little boggy and I, I, I felt like people could get stuck and had to come on outside this so I followed her go to come out of the airport with a fence, big high fence. And then I finally seen a truck way down there across us. I said, there's something activity going on here. We're not lost yet. So thank the Lord we got to that highway where that truck was fast. And it said, Cersei, Georgia, this way. And I knew where I was at. Then. So we all get misplaced, turned around, lost. David's been lost several times. I've been lost with him. We've, been, we've had a conference one time in, in uh, WMA, and, and we got lost even with the conference. You remember that, Brother David? We, was, we headed north, but somehow or other we decided we'd head north back. <laughs> But we find, but David finally figured that he didn't know he had the conference, and then we, it was getting dark on us too. But you can get lost, is what the main point is, uh, beating around the bush here too much, but we can get lost. Now, the question is can we be lost uh, eternally? Now. We can be if we haven't been saved. Eternal? We haven't been saved, we lost eternally. Oh yeah, that word, I didn't hear that heaven. You've got to be born of the Spirit of God eternally. If you're going to go to eternal heaven, and I feel like all of us are going to go to eternal heaven, because we have been delivered and saved before the foundation of the world. And in fact, Timothy 2 Timothy 1 9 says, Who has saved us and called us the Holy Ghost, not according to works, but Ephesians over there. So we're salvation, we're quickened. Ephesians 2, 1 starts off saying, you were what? Dead. All right, we have been quickened and made alive through Christ Jesus. Now once we have been made alive, then we are automatically going to go to eternal heaven hereafter. Do you agree? If you are quickened, I said. Now all men are not quickened 
but God's children that He chose before the foundation of the world and called them, we are going to be an eternal heaven and you cannot be lost. You cannot. Some people say on their deathbed, I got to get saved before I can go to eternal heaven. That's not true. You're already saved. But they mentioned that you've got to be saved. And how do you go about getting saved? God saves us. We don't save ourselves. Uh, when Jesus Christ came, He was He was our Savior. We didn't say ask Him to save us. He saved us because why? He loved us and called us. Over in Romans chapter eight, I think twenty-eight to there teaches about we have been called. That means you are one of His. And nothing can separate you. But now listen to this. Eternally, I ask the question, or can you eternally go to heaven? The only way is, is how? Through Christ Jesus, who has saved us, made us alive, opened our eyes, opened our ears, all these things. Now listen to this. We can eternally be lost. No. But the Bible tells us over in 8, uh, 8, 38 through 39, it says, Paul says when he wrote these words inspired by God, For I am persuaded, I'm convinced of no word. Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor power, nor height, nor any creature is able to separate you from the love of God. What is the love of God? Grace. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved love He has for those who He have called, those who He have chosen, those He has elected. All of them, we are God's children, and we do not save ourselves from being lost eternally. It's by the precious blood of Jesus. Right? It's by the blood only, by grace only, that you are saved. Nothing can separate you but love. Turn to uh, John chapter 6. That's St. John now. St. John chapter 6. Yes, how about reading John chapter 6, 37 through 40. And think about this. We didn't ask God for eternal, well, well you could ask God for eternal salvation, but you don't get it because you've asked it. You are given eternal salvation by Jesus Christ only. All right, John 6, 37. Before All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, so, the Father giveth, he says, all the Father giveth shall come to him. And I will, he says, I will no wise cast out. That's a precious promise of God right there. And he said, I didn't come to do my own will, but what? The Father's will. And turn to John chapter 10 now. Let's think about this. I shook a man's hand this past week uh, in town. And he, he was one of the kind that evidently had to work on a farm and a ranch and everything else because his hand was so big and so tough and strong. You ever grab it over somebody's? And I used to have a pretty good we, uh, handshake. You two, we'd try to squeeze each other's hands at work, wouldn't we, Dave? Oh, yeah. And I'd see who was the worst, who was the bad boy at him. Well, I shook a man's hand this past week, and he grabbed it, and he, he didn't intentionally try to hurt me, but he got to broke my hand. He got, that man was really strong, and I could tell him. But I got to think about that hand of God. Turn to, uh, turn to John chapter 10, think about this. Yeah. How that John chapter 10, verse 27, 28, and 29, brother David. <coughs> 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Think about the Father's hand, how powerful and how strong the hand of Jesus is, the hand of God. That man was strong, but Jesus says no man, including that man I'm talking about, or any other man, cannot pluck them out of my Father's hand, or out of my hand. And I picture us as God's people in the hand of God, and then he collapses the other hand on top of that one and makes it even more secure and impossible for anybody to touch it. That's how we are in Christ. You think anybody can break that hand where they could get you to make you be lost eternal? Absolutely not. We're in the hand of God. And we sing that song, Hand in Hand with Jesus. Well, he does that. He he, uh, we in the hand of God. Turn to Luke. Let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 15. We're very familiar with this. I want to go. I compare Zacchaeus and and the prodigal sons. We all know the prodigal sons. What what they done? But in Luke chapter 15. <coughs> In Luke chapter 15, uh, but maybe you want to read, uh, I think it's 11 to 32, isn't it? Hold on the page. Huh? That's the Bible Yeah, Luke chapter. Yeah, read that then. Maybe it's unheaded. What'd you say? 11 through? Yeah, I think it's 11. Uh, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that follow from me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into the far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent it all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave him to him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they well, began to be that. He was lost and then he was found. He was, a, he was a son whenever he left his house, his father's house. Was he a son? He had two sons that said that, that in it story that's our parable. When he left and went out there and started living a righteous living or a bad living, he came to himself. Now, is that showing you he has been quickened and made alive? Even though he was dead, his daddy said he was dead and now he's alive again, he was lost. This man was lost. Was he eternally lost? No, he wasn't eternally lost because he was a son of the Father which represents God the Father in this parable. And the, the prodigals were the sons 
were children of God. So he wasn't lost eternity, but he said he came to himself and he went back. And that's what his daddy said is, this is my son that was lost and is now found. So that's one example of a, one being lost. And then you think about Zacchaeus uh, in Luke 19. Well, let's just stay right here a minute. Let's go get Zacchaeus here. Here's where a woman, uh, a woman having ten pieces of silver, she lost her silver. It says in verse 8, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, she lose one piece, and does not light the candle and sweat and house and seek diligently till she find it. And when, and when she had found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So if we're sinners, in which we are by nature, we're no good, we all fall short by Romans 5, 12, through there teaches that. But if you repent, like the, the, the prodigal son turned back, he repented, he came to himself, in other words. So here is that woman rejoicing of that one lost coin. Then you got thinking about, I got thinking about, there was a hundred sheep. And one went where? Astray. astray. What does loss mean? Going astray, misplaced. Were the other 99 sheep important? Yeah. They were all important. They were all sheep. And sometimes we're considered as being lambs and sheep. Well, one of them went astray. They're like the prophet's son went astray. <coughs> Here, he leaves the 99 and goes after that one. That one was lost. Children of God can become lost. I'm not talking about eternity. We have discussed eternally you can never be lost. But you can, as a child of God, be lost to the fellowship of God and be separated from God. And then that's when you live a hell on earth. You follow? So 99 sheep, one went straight, that was important. And he rejoiced when he got that one and put it back in the boat. And we too are sheep that go astray, but Jesus will not lose you eternally, but when he, he will, what will he do to you for leaving the, the fold? Judgment comes on that sheep. That, to my understanding, that, and I don't know, I can't prove this or not, but they said the shepherd would actually break one of them's leg whenever he went astray and got misplaced to go. And that way he, he wouldn't, he'd, be, he'd have to carry him on the shoulder. And I don't know, like I say, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but it makes sense. If you break his leg, put him on the shoulder, he ain't going to go anywhere, is he? So, but we are cheap. Now turn to Luke 19 real quick. This is you, huh? Oh, the one called. Uh, Brother David, you haven't read yet. In Luke 19, verse 1, and think about being lost. L O S T. Just verse 1? 1 through 10. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacharias. Zacchaeus, excuse me, uh, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press because he was little of statue. And he ran before and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the, uh, to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide in thy house. And he made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he uh, was gone to be guest with the man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, 
the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken all things, if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also, uh, he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Right, that verse 3, Zach, uh, Jesus was coming through Jericho. And verse 3 tells us that Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus. He would want to see him in bad book. And now he had been a tax collector, and he had robbed, actually robbed people of their money. Tax collector would gather the money, and then they'd get anything over what the government or whatever it was wanted. That would go in his pocket. Well... He began to swindle people, in other words. And then, you know how the prodigal son came to himself? And then the, the, he, the same thing here with Zacchaeus. He came to himself. He realized, I've done wrong. He started to repent. He was starting to seek Jesus. So he sought him, it says in verse 3. And as, and as Zacchaeus said, that he would give back everything that he had stole from the poor folk. Then it comes right on down to that tenth verse. That's what I'm trying to get at. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Jesus. It wasn't Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus was born of the Spirit of God. He had already been quicker. He had been made alive. Then he realized, I've done wrong. When God opened your eyes and you see where you've done wrong, you didn't see it before. The natural man can't receive those things. He can't see them, can't hear them, can't touch them. But once he has been quickened and made alive, then he felt a, had a repentant heart about him. And he gave back. And they were calling him a, a, a sinner and everything else. And Jesus was going home to eat with sinners and all these things. That didn't mean nothing. The main point was that he has sought Jesus. And when he sought Jesus, Jesus told him, Zacchaeus, come down. Today is the day of what? Thy salvation. Not eternal salvation. Thy salvation right here as you live. Can you lose your soul? Man is made up of soul, body, and spirit. Can you lose your soul? Listen to this word. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 16, 25 and 26, it says, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And now listen closely here. It says, What if a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and what? Lose his own soul. You can have all the money in the world, all the things that shine, all the things that you pleases you, and lose your soul over those things. The rich young ruler understood that. The other rich man uh, that come running to Jesus wanting me to turn alive, he realized that. He finally comes down to a point he has lost his soul. And you and I can lose our soul. So what the man profit to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What can he give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. You remember? Yeah, I don't remember where it's at, but there's two men that tried, uh, well, one man. Right? One man tried to buy the Holy Ghost. Y'all remember that? I don't remember the word. I think it's an ax. But he tried to buy the Holy Ghost. Can't buy the Holy. You can't exchange this or that or the other for the Holy Spirit. You have to. That is comes from who? God, God, and God alone. <clears throat> There's a lot of others I could go to, but let's just go to one more. Matthew seven thirteen and fourteen. Matthew seven thirteen and fourteen. Tasha, will you read Matthew 7, 13, and 14? Yes, sir. And think about losing your soul. You can lose something from, from 
Go ahead. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there, because straight is the gate, and there is a way which leadeth into life, and few there be that find it. All right. Can you lose the kingdom of heaven? Mm -hmm. we, we've all, well, I don't know, I'm like Brother David on this. I don't know how high I've ever been on the kingdom. But I do know there's a kingdom that rocks peace and joy of the Holy Spirit that you can have heaven on earth now. And, and you won't lose that heaven on earth if, condition, if you do the work of God. You can say, Lord, Lord, all you want to, but you're not going to enter the kingdom, but you got to do something. Obey Him, believe Him, trust Him, and all these things. And then you will not lose your salvation, but you'll gain the salvation of this. But this, the, in Matthew 13, it tells us there's two ways we can go. You can go a broad way, and you're going to lose the kingdom. Or you can go that hard way, straight and narrow way, and enjoy the kingdom. Now you're going to lose something if you go the wrong way. That may seem good, but what are you going to lose? You're going to lose the kingdom if you go the wrong way. But I, I pray that we'll walk down that straight and narrow and suffer persecution and then there's a great joy comes from all that. So we're in Acts 14, 22, I think it is, it says, there's much tribulation or much trouble to enter the kingdom. So I pray that we'll walk that straight and narrow, not the broad way, and not lose the kingdom we have right now. So